Good evening, and welcome to Darren Brown's Infamous. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Darren Brown. trapped inside our own heads and our beliefs and understandings about the world are limited by that perspective. I came out when I was 31, presumed that I was gay when I was a teenager, so that's 15, 16 years of pretending this huge part of you doesn't exist, of dreading the subject of sex and generally feeling like you don't fit in. And then many years later you realise you have to come out, you have to tell people about it at some point. I didn't mean you specifically just then, sorry, I was just looking, sorry, one, forgive me, I was just gesturing. One has to come out, and when you do, this is my point, if you have any, any secret, whatever it is, anything that you, that you carry around with you and you think you couldn't possibly tell people, when you finally do, when you finally summon up the courage to get this big thing off your chest, you realise people don't care. They don't care, not really, not even your best friends in the nicest way, you don't really care because they are also trapped inside their own heads. They are the center of their own worlds, and stuff you're saying to them is just some information about you, really. It's all that is like what I'm telling you now. It's, it's big stuff for me, for you, it's just some information about me. The novelist David Foster Wallace said, brilliantly, I think, you'll worry a lot less about what other people think of you when you realize how seldom they do. It's very good, but we're terrible at realizing what goes on in other people's heads because we are trapped inside our own, and one consequence of that is that we're particularly bad at realizing how fundamentally similar we all are. So if you're in your 30s, I'm talking to you now. There'll be concerns that you might have or uh, issues that you might be facing, which you may feel just apply to you. The comforting reality is they apply to pretty much everybody in their 30s. Women in that age group, you'll have started going to the doctors more often. And men, very common, particularly in your later 30s, to feel stuck in a rut and to fear the possibility of an extramarital affair. And statistically, in an audience this size, 13 of you will be having an affair right now. <laughs> 13 of you. I don't mean right now, right this second. <laughs> but for, although there is something going on up the top. Can't quite tell what it is. But 13 of you, and these are real patterns of behavior. There are similar patterns for people in their 40s and 50s and 60s and so on throughout life. So if I were a psychic, which I am not, or if I claim to have special powers, which I really don't, I could use that kind of information to seemingly know a lot about you or give somebody a, a powerful reading. So imagine you've come to see me and I'm a stage psychic. And I say that I'm picking up some kind of psychic vibration from somebody in the audience and I say it's, uh, uh, it's a lady. Uh, and actually, could you, I promise I won't ask you off on stage, could you just put your hand up if you are a lady? Just so we can see how it works out in terms of numbers. So please do this on the balconies as well and right up at the top of the back. Keep your hands up as long as this continues to apply to you, all right? So let's say I'm sensing it's a lady and uh, sort of a young, youngish lady, sort of around 20, that kind of age, and, uh, and I'm sensing your name begins with um, an F. It's a random letter, but it'll just help narrow you down. So keep your hands up as long as this has continued to apply to you, right? Now, in the dark, it can feel a bit special. I think he's talking to me. <laughs> Whereas the reality is, if do keep your hands up, if we just bring the lights up for a moment, we bring the lights up, if you look around you, you should see in the nicest way, nothing special happening at all. Just a bunch of Fs sat in the dark. Actually, could you stand up if you've got your hand up? Could you stand up? One, two, three, four, okay, so, so yeah, good. All right, a good number of you. Anybody on these other balconies? Yeah, hello, great. Could you stand up? We'll get a microphone to you. This is on the upper circle. The rest of you can sit down. I think I'll just talk to this lady here, but thank you so much for standing. What's your name? Faye. Faye, nice to meet you, Faye. If you don't mind me asking, how old are you? 20. 20. Have you got any pets? Yeah. What have you got? Don't say their names, just like dogs, cats, whatever they are, it's fine. Dogs. Dogs, what breed? Uh, staff. Staff, okay, good. You said dogs, is that two? Yeah. Did you name them both yourself? Uh, family name. Family name them, okay. All right, how long ago did they name them? Roughly, what are we talking about? A few years ago? Uh, about 10, 11 years ago. 10, 11 years ago. Okay, what do your parents do for a living? Or at least what were they doing back then? Uh, hairdresser and electrician. Hairdresser and electrician, okay, good. Okay, the dog's male, female, one of each? Female. Okay, both female? Yeah. All right, now listen, I, you're going to tell me the name of one of the dogs, 
and I'm going to work out what they would have called the other dog, all right? So if, if you think of both of the names, if you think one of them is maybe a little more obvious than the other one, then give me that one so I can work out the, the more unusual one, all right? Uh, so take your time, but just give me, give me the name of one of the dogs. Ebby. Ebby? Yeah. E-B-B-Y? E-B-B-I. A-E-B-B-I. Maybe short for Ebony, is it a black yeah. dog? Okay, all right, good. So this will be the name of the other one. All right, and it's a female? Yeah. Okay, and they name both of them together. All right, just imagine you are calling this dog to you. Imagine you're calling the dog to you. All right, now as you do that, uh, just keep repeating the name in your mind again and again. And now the lips remain sort of quite relaxed, importantly, so we know there's no sort of plosive sounds or um, like P's or B's or anything that would bring the lips together. Uh, so keep repeating the names. No, it's also at the front of the mouth, so you've got like an N or a T maybe, and I think we're starting with a S, a S sound or a Z. Oh, there you go, careful. Uh, <laughs> you don't need to say yes, that's okay. I'll uh, work it out. I appreciate the help, just takes the challenge out of it somewhat. So. <laughs> Uh, oh, there you go, back up there again. So just keep repeating the name, just shout the name, Not, nothing out loud, but in your mind, just shout the name like you're screaming, screaming to this dog to come to you, right? Louder and louder until you are... Oh, no, they uh, called it Xena. <laughs> Xena with an X, like the princess... Yeah. Well, yeah, thank you very much indeed, great, take a seat. Well done, thank you. <laughs> so... Thank you so much. So this is... This is genuinely specific information, right? Not just things that would apply to everybody. So let's keep this really specific. Put your hands up now if you're a man aged between 28 and 35. Put your hands up. Keep them up if you are in the earning group 20 to 50K. And then keep them up if you've been in a relationship for at least two years. Otherwise, drop your hands. All right? Good. OK, we get the lights up. Let's choose one of you. I'm going to choose from downstairs. So upstairs, you may drop your hands. I'll come to you in a moment. Uh, let's keep your hands up downstairs. All right, wave your hands so I can see you, so I can see more clearly. OK, all right. I want to get this over this side. So can somebody get it to somebody with a hand up? Doesn't have to be the person nearest you. Just take a look around you, get it to somebody with a hand up. Uh, OK, could you stand up for me, sir? There's a microphone there. Rest of you can drop your hands. Let me talk to this gentleman. All right, great. What's your name, sir? Nick. Nick. OK, Nick. So we're going to go really specific, Nick. I want you to think of a word, an English word. Ideally, at least, at least four letters, but it doesn't have to be. If you want to go shorter, that's up to you. But have you got something? Yep. Yeah. OK. Now, whatever you're thinking of, Nick, is the first word that's just come into your head. And I've just stood you up in front of 2,000 people and asked you to do that. I don't want you going home later saying to yourself, he, he just put me on the spot. I didn't get a chance to think. I bet everyone just thinks of the same word. So right now, Nick, is when you change your mind again and again and again so you don't have that excuse later on. All right? You can imagine, if you like, you're looking through a dictionary. Uh, <clears throat> maybe you come across an unusual word, maybe not too unusual. Maybe that in itself would be quite predictable. Just take your time, uh, have a look through it. You've got 26 letters of the, to look through. Take your time until you come across a word you're absolutely happy that you, I could not just rely on everybody thinking of. Have you got something in your mind now? Change your mind as many times as you like. Yes? Yeah, I'm happy. OK, there's a guy with a pen and paper just there. Two things, Nick. You're going to write this word down nice and large and clearly, please, because we are going to show it around. But, Nick, really importantly, don't let anybody see what you write. Stick it in the envelope when you're done. Thank you. So this is really specific, right? Even more specific than a pet's name. Uh, which actually just reminds me of something. I'll, uh, let me just show you this briefly, just while Nick's writing his word down. Can I get this to a lady on or near the aisle? Somewhere over here. So, lady on or near the aisle. Somebody, sorry. <laughs> just pass it around. So it's a lady on or near the aisle. Thank you. Somebody stand up with it. Hello, what's your name, madam? Amanda. Amanda, nice to meet you. Do you, know, do you have a mobile phone number? That, do you know it off by heart? Yes. Yes, could you write it down for me? There's a guy with a yes. pen and paper there. Gentlemen. <laughs> That's how you do it. People waste so much time. Um, don't, Amanda, don't let anybody see. Just write it down, fold it up, put it in your pocket when you're done. I saw a psychic do this. I always go and see psychic shows when I can. This one was up above a pub, packed out with people in their 60s and 70s which is maybe why this flew past them. But the psychic asked a lady to write down her mobile phone number, fold it up, put it in a pocket, without anybody seeing. Are you doing that for me, Amanda? Is it out of the way? Yep, lovely, thank you. And she said it was a test, that the spirits would be able to tell what the phone number was. Well, it was just a bit odd, but, you know, it kind of made sense, so I was intrigued. So could you stay standing for me, Amanda, if you don't mind? Thank you. So just get that right out of the way in your pocket or something, if you've got one. Thank you. So she... And obviously, you know, you try not to be um, judgmental or, you know, but you try and keep an open mind. But I swear to God, she goes... Um, she goes, <sighs> all right, love, I'm getting your grandma. She's coming through. <laughs> Does actually sound like, and I've said that out loud. <laughs> I'm getting your grandma, love. She's giving me a phone number as proof that she's coming through. All right, she's saying, <sighs> she's saying, she's giving me an O. She's saying there's an O at the start of the number. Is that right? Is that right, love? Yeah. Is there an air at the start? Thank you. Just passing it on, whatever comes through. She's saying, 
She, oh, she was a right chatterbox, so she's giving me another number. She's saying... Thanks. So she's saying a seven. She's saying 07 at the start. Is that right? Yes. Is there an 07 at the start? Thank you very much. She's... She is... She, no, she's fading away now, love. She's fading away, Petal. <laughs> but that's something you can take away with for yourself. That's forty pounds. You can sit yourself back down. Thank you. I swear it was pathetic. Sorry. Thank you so much, Amanda. It was truly embarrassing. Did that give you enough time, Nick, to write your word down? It did. Yes. 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 It did. Yes. Okay. Have you put it in the envelope? Yes. Yes. Good. Because I also have an envelope. <laughs> okay. So Nick, can you get yourself to the bottom of the stairs on this side? Just push past the camera, people over there for me. And can someone who doesn't mind just reading something out briefly just nip up on the stage? Anyone that fancies coming up, quick as you can. Somebody come up here. It's going to be you, I think. What's your name, sir? Luke. Luke. Give Luke a hand. I've become Luke. Thank you very much. <laughs> nice to meet you, Luke. Can you take this off my back? You take it off my back. Thank you. Pull it off. Pull it. Pull it. Pull it. Come stand here. Come stand there for me, Nick. Just there. Uh, no, Luke, rather. Luke. Uh, Nick's over there. Right, Luke. Just here. Could you take it out? There's a letter in there. If you take that out for me, I'm going to read this out. But your job is just to check over my shoulder that I'm not changing anything. All right. I'll take it out. Thank you so much. All right. Are you there, Nick? So look, as I read this out, please, when it gets to the important bit, don't react. So, uh, tonight on the 27th of March, that is tonight, at the Grand Theatre Leeds, that's where we are, I shall ask someone to think of a word. Oh, I did say a man aged between 28 and 35. You are, aren't you? Yes. yes? And in the earning group, 20 to 50k? Yes. And in long-term relationship? Yes. Okay. Uh, <laughs> um, <clears throat> the fact the weather has been cold and overcast today, so you start thinking more about inside sort of things, indoorsy things. The language I use when I ask them to think of a word, and I was using very visual language with the dictionary and so on. Uh, the fact that I've stood them up, which means they'll be thinking under pressure, and I got you to change your mind again and again and again, which sort of increases that pressure and starts to kind of uh, push them down certain avenues. All these and other subtle factors will combine to hopefully psychologically force the person to think of a particular word, which is film, all right? Film as in, uh, you know, as in movies or... Um, Film, right? Camera film, film, movies and so on. Do you want to bring yourself up here? Come and stand here for me. Thank you, Nick. Do you want to keep reading this out? If you just go from, go from there, from the person, into the mic. Off you go, Luke. Thank you. The person who wrote the word has been told not to react. If they have written any word in the English language other than film, this does not reflect badly on Darren or his presented <laughs> skills. <laughs> Fair point. But if I, but if, excuse me, if out of all the words they could have chosen, they have written film, the audience will go mental. And it does say it there very clearly in print. Mental. Um, you've got this, you've got this look like this hasn't worked, and I think I know why. Um, whatever it is, if you take it out, hold it up, show the camera there, like for a good five seconds, so everybody can read it. Whatever it is, just shout into the mic as well what it is. Sorry, I've sealed it. Oh, you've sealed it? Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. God, the suspense. No, no, no. Christ. The word is film. The word is film, you did! <laughs> there you go, keep going that. You can have that if you like. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Luke. Thank you too, Luke. Luke and Nick! <laughs> Thank you so much. I would love. <clears throat> She's coming back through. Amanda, love, stand up, your grandma, she's come back. <laughs> All right, she's saying there's a number in your phone number like a five or a three or a nine. <laughs> yes. Which one? Three. Three, that's what she's saying now. She's showing me a three very clearly. The others have fading away. She's... <laughs> there's not a triple two in the middle, is there, love? Two, two, two? No. No, that's what she's saying. There's not a triple two in, in the middle. <laughs> It's another 40 pounds, you can sit yourself back down. Thank you, I'm sorry. Listen, if you've ever been to see a spiritualist medium, or particularly if you think you may go and see a medium at some point, I would love for you to come up on stage in the second half of this show and allow me to do a form of mediumship with you. So if this appeals to you and you are 18 or over, can you bring yourself to those stairs in the interval? They'll bring you up when it's safe to come up. But first, I would love to give one of you a, a gift, but a real gift. The gift of a trance state. And this trance state will be such that for the brief amount of time that you are in it, it'll be the equivalent of spending a week at a really expensive, exclusive spa somewhere. So I'm only going to choose one of you to give you the full experience. But nonetheless, you can all take part in this and get a taste of it and feel what it's like, because it's so good for you and it feels amazing. So if you'd like to do it, please, stand up. Up you get. Up you get. Come on, feet flat on the floor. Stand yourselves up. 
If you stand with your hands down by your sides, and stand with your feet about a hips width apart, so you can stand quite solidly, quite comfortably, good. Anybody watching this at home, this will not work on you at home, all right? You can watch the show quite safely, it won't have any influence on you at home, so don't worry about that. I'm not quite gonna hypnotize you, it's a little bit different, because I want you to be aware of it. That's the whole point, is that you enjoy it. Okay, good. So take a look at me. Take a deep breath, right the way in, now. Bring it all the way in, right the way in. And then let it out. Again, deep breath all the way in. And out. And again, all the way in. And out. Now, tense up the muscles in your feet and your legs. And with your eyes closed now, listen very carefully. You're keeping your eyes closed. In a moment, I'm going to count to three and click my fingers. When I do, you will go straight down into this sleep state. You'll remain standing. Your head will drop down. Your breathing will become lovely and deep and rhythmical. And you can just sink straight down. Still hearing and understanding everything. Here we go. Just go with it. I want you to enjoy it. Here we go. One, two, three. Three, sleep, but as your head drops down, just let your whole body relax. And as you do this, I want you to imagine that you are walking down a staircase. And each step that you take on the staircase relaxes you more and takes you deeper. Each breath that you breathe relaxes you more and takes you deeper into this sleep, still hearing and understanding everything. And as you do this, I'm gonna come down and talk to a couple of you. And the nice thing is it'll take me a couple of minutes to find a couple of you to talk to, which gives you plenty of time to just continue to sink and drift deeper and deeper down at your own rate and speed. That's really good. That's really good. Let me come across to talk to a couple of you as you continue down the staircase, each step taking you deeper, each word that I say relaxing you more and taking you deeper into that sleep. Excuse me, can I bring you out of there? Good. So I'm just going to talk to a gentleman here. I'm putting my hand on your shoulder. You'll know that I'm talking to you as you carry on sleeping. I'm going to bring your arm out here. We're going to lock it into place. So clench your fist and lock that arm tightly into place. Now tighter and tighter, locking it tightly into place. That's good. So tight. Now that when I take my hand away, it just carries on locking all on its own. Tighter and tighter into place. You see, the more you try to unlock it, the more it just keeps on locking. Tighter and tighter. That's good. Until I touch you on the hand again. And when I do, it'll be released. And as it comes down, you'll just sink and tumble and fall so deeply down into that sleep now right the way down I got you right the way deep and right the way sound asleep just drifting and sinking down that's really good excellent very good thank you so in a moment I'm going to count backwards from three to zero and this will wake you up it'll bring you up and out of the sleep and very importantly I'm talking to you all as a group but I'm also talking to each of you as an individual I'm talking to the deepest part of your unconscious mind three here we go waking up has never felt so good two and one, and when you are quite ready to be fully wide awake for the rest of the evening, zero, you can open your eyes, come back to us, be fully wide awake, to take a look around you. Feels good, doesn't it? <laughs> Enjoy that. Nice, isn't it? Yeah. Hi, hello, great. So, uh, take a seat, apart from you, what's your name? Adam. Adam, lovely to meet you, Adam. Give Adam a big hand, could you take this off? Just put that on your chair in front of you. Uh, give Adam a hand as you bring him up. Adam, come Adam. Love it. I'll be done, Adam. Thank you. The rest of you can take a seat, Tommy. Thank you, Adam. All of you, please, as I'm bringing up Adam, can you all please take a look? All of you at both of your neighbours. Very quickly, people on both sides of you. Everybody do that for me now. Even if you don't know them, just a quick look. Thank you, Adam. I'm going to stand you there facing the front. Thank you so much. A quick look to people on both sides. If either of your neighbours is still asleep, <laughs> now's a really good time to let me know. Put your hand up and make a fuss, otherwise I will presume everybody is wide awake. Good. So is it Adam? Adam, nice to meet you. Thank you. Look at me now and just sleep. Right the way back down, right the way deep. I got you. Right the way sound asleep. Just drifting and sinking and floating and spiraling. That's good. My voice just there in the center of your head. One thing that really interests me about this fact that we are trapped inside our own heads, that we're the center of our own world, is that we tend to think that problems in life are real and solid and permanent. The reality is those same things, just viewed from a different perspective, can suddenly seem temporary and flimsy somehow. And Adam, you're really good at this. And every time I put you back into this sleep, you are gonna go deeper, it'll be richer, it'll be more enjoyable each time that you do this. But for now, I want you just to slowly reorientate yourself back to the room. You'll feel yourself waking up, you feel that refreshment moving up through you. When you're quite ready, you can open your eyes and come back to us. Excellent.
Thank you, Adam. All right, so let me show you this here. This is something you can all do with each other. You need to get yourself a box that you can put your hand through. I can just do it a little more quickly with Adam because I know he'll be very responsive to this. Adam, I'm going to put something in this box. I don't want you seeing what it is. So if you don't mind, just face the front and just, just close your eyes just so you can't see. It's nothing, uh, it's nothing unpleasant. It's a very ordinary household object. I just don't want you seeing what it is. Okay. Okay, Adam, you can open your eyes now for me. Thank you. Can you put your hand flat on top of the box? Maybe take a sideways step towards it as well. Please don't look at what's in there. Thank you. All right. So in a minute, I'm going to get you to lower your hand into the box and find the object. You will probably tell what it is pretty quickly, but it's not really about you identifying it. This is just about you paying attention to kind of the sensations that you get and how you interpret them, okay? So lower your hand in for me. Find the object. First question, how would you describe the temperature of that object? Room temperature. Room temperature, yeah. good. And if, if you squeeze it, would you say it was sort of soft or hard or squidgy or...? Slightly plain. Slightly but plain, okay. Hard, yeah. Very good. Now, you're lifting it up. Is it light or heavy? It's light. Can you tell what it is? Apple. It is indeed an apple. Great. So leave the apple where it is. Bring your hand out for me, Adam. That's great. Thank you. Hand by your side again. Would you close your eyes again for me, please? Just face the front. Thank you. Good. You're doing great. This time, I'm going to cover the front of the box so none of you see what it is. So you keep your eyes close to me as well. Good. Uh, give me just a moment. You're doing great, Adam. OK, you can open your eyes for me. Hand on top of the box again. This time, um, we'll do it a little bit differently, and I would invite you to join in with this, if you like. I want you to think of something in your life, Adam. I won't ask you what it is. Something that makes you feel... Something that feels like it's big and getting on top of you at the moment. Feels like it's weighing you down. You think of something? Good. All right. Now, whatever you're thinking of, if you run it through in your mind like a sort of a movie, as you sort of think it through to get those feelings, you'll notice you make that movie screen up here. You make it big and on top of you, which is why it feels like that, all right? Now, if you shrink that down, to the size of an iPad, and then bring that down here instead, and take a look at it there instead, Adam. Now watch the same thing, but on that little screen instead. No longer feels like it's getting on top of you, because now you're on top of it. Same thing, but a very different perspective. In fact, as you watch it there now, you can start to feel a real feeling of stability and confidence moving through you. A very different feeling as you watch it. And that can expand up into your chest and shoulders. That's good. It can feel really good as you start to feel like a giant towering above this thing that used to feel like a problem. As you feel like a colossus towering above this stage. Good, solid and confident, that's good. Lower your hand into the box now and look at me, look at me. Fingertips, all right, just with your fingertips, find the object, just very gently. Try and keep looking at me as you do this. Find it in the middle there. First question as you move your fingers along it is, what would you say it's made of? And a guess. Metal. Metal, good. Now just get a sense of the shape of it, move your fingertips along it, perhaps you can tell what it is. What would you, what do you think? A spoon. A spoon, what sort of spoon, Adam? Tablespoon, silver spoon. Like a big one or a little one? Little one. Little like a teaspoon? Yeah, teaspoon, yeah. Teaspoon? Yeah. Great, okay, you leave that teaspoon where it is. Then look at me, just bring your hand out, leave the teaspoon where it is, bring your hand out of the box. Good, excellent, lovely. Face the front, close your eyes again for me, just close your eyes. I'll show you all the teaspoon that he was feeling. Um, I just don't want you seeing, so do keep your eyes closed. As he was feeling confident, feeling like a giant, this was the teaspoon that he felt. All right, you're doing great. Just keep your eyes closed, me, Adam, but you are doing... Brilliantly. I'm going to cover the front of the box again so you can't see. I'll put one more thing in there. Uh, this is a slightly trickier object to get in, so give me just a moment with this one. Yeah, one. Okay, keep your eyes closed. It's a little longer, Adam. Open your eyes for me. Hand on top of the box. This time, you're going to think of something that makes you feel warm and safe and cosy. Anything you like in life. It could be a person or a place or a memory or something that makes you feel nice and warm and safe and cosy. You got something? Okay. Whatever you're picturing there, just bring that image in a little closer. Make the colours softer and fuzzier. That's lovely. Just keep that feeling there. And look at me again. Lower your hand into the box. Very gently this time. Absolute fingertips, all right? Absolute fingertips. Find the object. And then really gently, maybe let your hand move underneath it a little. Let it move onto your hand a little. Get a sense of, would you say it's light or heavy? What would you say now? Light. Again? Light. Light. Very good. Now, more complicated shape this time, Adam. So take your time with it. You might be able to get a sense of what it is. If you take your time and feel the shape of it and the contours, what do you think it is? A glove. A glove? Yeah. What sort of glove? Like a woolly glove or a leather glove? or A, a woolly glove. A little louder, please. 
A woolly glove. A woolly glove, great. You leave that woolly glove where it is then, please. Bring your hand out for me. Bring your hand out. Very gently, let it... Good, lovely. Hands by your sides. Close your eyes again for me. Thank you, and I'll show you all the woolly glove that he was feeling. I just don't want you seeing again. So, perhaps we can get that. Thank you, could you take that for me? Lovely, great, thank you. Open your eyes, face the front for me, good. Clearly an odd reaction for you, I realise. Thank you. Uh, clearly they were seeing something there that, that, that you weren't seeing, I realise that. Um, but I'm sure your friends will explain to you what happened when you join them again. Come forward for me. Um, so, uh, point is, you're very good at this, Adam, right? And I'd like to give you this trance state as a, uh, as a gift. But this is going to happen in the interval, is that all right? Oh, yeah, yeah. Who are you with here tonight? Uh, my mum and my sister. Your mum and your sister, OK. Yeah. Um, what's, what's your mum's name? Christine. Christine, all right, I might talk, talk to her in a moment. Have you got a mobile phone on you at the moment? I do. OK, can I, I'm going to take that for a moment. Yeah. I will give it to your mum in just a second as well, thank you. All right, could you sit yourself up here for me? You're happy to do this in the interval, yeah? Yeah. Great, lovely, OK. <laughs> we'll look after your mum and sister, we'll get them a drink as well, we'll make sure they're taken care of. Just swing your legs around for me. And then, yeah, and then lay back as well, so we'll check, we'll check the pillow's in the right place and you're comfortable and uh, just get yourself comfy. All right, and put your legs out and good. Now sit yourself straight back up. Okay. Happy get, lovely. So, um... <laughs> <laughs> so Adam, <laughs> this trance state now we're going to do, it only exists for your benefit. It's the only reason for doing this. Uh, this is a completely private and personal thing for you now. Bring your finger up for me like this. Yeah. Just point your finger, good. So in a moment, I'm going to touch my finger to yours. When I do, your eyes will close. You'll go back into this trance state, and your trance journey will begin. Are you ready? Good. I'll see you on the other side. Excellent, Adam. That's really good. Thank you. And Adam, you can now just sleep. And as you sleep, you can drift and sink back down that staircase. As you sink deeper, everything else happens a hundred miles away. And just to make sure that your experience is really kept quite separate and private and detached, we're placing a sort of cocoon around you, just to make sure that your experience is kept quite separate as you sink deeper and deeper down into that trance state. And everything else happens a hundred miles away as you continue down that staircase. That's really good. So I can talk to all of you, and Adam can hear me. It just doesn't distract him as he sinks deeper down into his trance state. Uh, his mum, Christine, could you stand up for me? Where are you? Over there somewhere, I guess. Hi, Christine. So I'm going to ask you to draw a picture. Um, there's a couple of things that are important, so please, I, I want you to understand this. First of all, it needs to be a drawing of something that is a real-world physical object, something you could actually touch, as opposed to just like a geometric shape or a design or something like that. Does that make sense? OK, and if there's anything else that you just think that Adam might think that you personally would draw for some reason, then ignore that as well, all right? Can you think of something suitable now? Yeah, perfect, all right. Whatever you draw, there's a guy with a pen and paper at the side there. When you've drawn it, Christine, can you write underneath what it is? Then you won't worry about how accurately you've drawn it as well. So write what it is, but don't let anybody see, including the guy with the pen and paper and none of the cameramen or anything like that either. When you've done it, remember, write underneath what it is and then seal it in an envelope. You should have an envelope there as well. Thank you, Christine, if you can go and do that for me now. Thank you. So. Um, while Christine's doing that, let me explain what's going to happen next. We're going to take an interval. If, during this interval, you would like to come up on stage in the second half, if you have a genuine interest in the possibility of mediumship, please bring yourself to the bottom of the steps on that side there. They will bring you up in the interval when it's safe to come up. When you do come up, take a look at Adam. He's sleeping quite soundly. And then come and sit yourself down. Uh, did that give you enough time to draw your picture, Christine? Yeah. Great. Could you bring yourself up here for me? Thank you. Great. So, first of all, I'm just going to give you Adam's phone. I just took off him up there, so you've got that. Thank you. And can you write your name for me? Um, in big letters, you can lean on this if you like, but just um, right where you've sealed it, right across that joint, so you know it can't now be tampered with, right across the joint. Thank you, Christine. Lovely. Thank you. I'll put that there. Thank you. And you take his phone. Thank you. So, come over here for me. Come and take a look at your son. He's sleeping quite soundly. There's a couple of things I need to ask you to do, and they're both really important, all right? First thing is, you have to keep that a secret. Now, no one saw what you drew, did they? No, great. So please keep it a secret. Don't even tell your daughter that you're with here as well. Absolute secret. The other thing is, every two or three minutes throughout the interval, can you please remember, in your head, just say to yourself, Adam, I drew a... And then whatever it is, as if you were kind of whispering in his ear what it was. But that isn't out loud, that is just silently in your head but you must do it. You promise to do that, even though that sounds a bit odd. All right, lovely, thank you. Well, there'll be an usher to take a drink order for you both, and we'll make sure you're taken care of, but thank you so much, and I'll speak to you in the second half. Thank you, Christine. So I'm hoping that while Adam sleeps, 
that he'll be able to intuit at some level what his mother has drawn and sealed into that envelope. Just continue to sink and drift down even more deeply into the sleep as you find yourself now in a beautiful garden and as you lay on the grass and as you feel the warmth of the grass beneath you and then the fresh air as the breeze blows through the garden keeping the temperature to the perfect level and as you do this I'm going to bring your hands up onto your chest which will actually help you sleep even more deeply so I'm going to bring them up here as you continue to sleep Good. Thank you. Excellent. You just need to get to your stomach, so I'm just going to roll your T-shirt up a little as you sleep. I'm just going to bring this up here and tuck it in. Good. Thank you. Thank you. So I thought in this half of the show I would talk to you about some of my obsessions. <laughs> Ten years ago, my father called me up to tell me he'd been diagnosed with cancer. And it turned out to be an early form of cancer. It was quite treatable, and ten years later, he's, he's fine. But at the time, I was quite shaken up by it. And I spoke to a few friends about it. One girl that I spoke to that I knew said, um, you should take him to see the homeopath that my mum saw when she had cancer. He completely cured it. And I thought, a couple of things. First of all, I thought, yeah, your mum also had six months of chemotherapy, which you've just edited out of that story, but OK. And secondly, I know about things like homeopathy because they do interest me. There have been dozens of systematic reviews of all of the hundreds of tests that have been done on homeopathy over the years, proper tests. And we do know now for a fact that it doesn't work. We know that. The results are actually very clear, quite unambiguous. It doesn't work. It doesn't have any real effect. And, uh, and I tried to nicely explain this to her, and she said, well, it is your dad, though. You could afford to be a bit more open-minded. Open-minded. Uh, thank you. Stand it just there. Thank you. Stay still, watch your hands out. In the Philippines, if you have cancer, there's a form of treatment available to you where the surgeon, without using any instruments or any knives, uses psychic vibrations to enter the body of the patient. So you will feel, Adam, a little bit of poking here for a moment, and then all of this just happens 100 miles away. That's good. and removes from inside any cancerous tumours or demonised parts. You OK? Yeah. <laughs> thank you. Would you uh, sit yourself back down again, thank you. Of course, it's a conjuring trick. It's a really ugly scam called psychic surgery. And sometimes, rather like with homeopathy, sometimes people do get better, surprisingly, either because they were just going to get better anyway, or because of the placebo effect, which just means that for some people with low-level conditions, their belief that this is actually going to help is enough to create a genuine improvement, which is great for those people, but clearly not the same as saying that this is uh, an effective treatment or something that you'd want to use instead of medicine that does actually stand up to testing, let alone anything, sadly, that's ever going to help cancer. But hey, got to be open-minded. Being open-minded, it doesn't mean just believing everything. 
because you'd like it to be true. Being truly open-minded is about being prepared to change your beliefs based on the evidence or the lack of evidence. Otherwise, you can be so open-minded that your brain falls out. Hold that thought. I'm going to come back to it. Thank you, Adam. That's really great. I'm going to bring this back down now. And Adam, you can now take all the time that you need to completely and slowly wake up out of the trance. You will feel this refreshment move right the way through you, right the way to the top of your head. And when you're quite ready, you'll find that your eyes will open all on their own and you'll be fully back with us. Take all the time that you need. Hello. Hi. <laughs> just want to sit yourself up. Take your time. Just slowly sit yourself up. Don't worry about any blood on the sheets. That's fine. Just up you go. <laughs> swing yourselves around. Just swing your legs around that way. Just, just pop yourself there for a moment. Um, let me get you some water. You've got a bit of a dry mouth. I can get a microphone as well. Uh, there you go. I haven't touched that one. There you go. Have that. Well, can I just get this in there? Can I just move your leg there for a bit? Um, so you were great. How, what's it like coming out of it? It feels pretty good, doesn't it? Yeah. 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 <laughs> bit sort of spaced out, but it feels good, yeah? There's a bunch of people up here behind you, by the way. This is the second half of the show now. <laughs> um, so great. Listen, oh, one thing. Um, do you remember this box? We could bring this box out again from Adam. You remember how you, you had your hand in this yeah. box before? Um, so look, if you look through the front, you, it's important you look, you'll see there's nothing in there. And you can all see from the back, there's nothing in the box, right? So put your hand flat on top for me, Adam. So look, there's nothing in there, right? But in a moment, you're going to lower your hand in. And as you do, I'm going to count from one to five, and you will feel something inside the box. Something will come from the back of your mind, down to your fingertips. You'll be able to feel it in the box. You'll be able to describe it to me. And you'll do a really good job of describing that to me. So here we go. Lower your hand in now as I count. Look at me. One, two... Three, there you go. Four, that's good. Five. So your first question, Adam, is this thing that you're feeling, does it feel like something living or something man-made? Man-made. Man-made, okay, good. All right, so take your time with it now. I just want you to carry on just describing, just describe to me what sort of surface, does it, can you tell what it's made of? Is it like solid, is it plastic, is it furry, is it what kind of surface are you getting? Plastic. Like plastic, okay. Yeah. Can you describe it? maybe its shape to me or what you're sort of, uh, what's it like? A cylinder. Okay, great. Yeah, but not really cylinder. Go on. It's sort of cylindrical, sort of, yeah? Yeah. Go on, so keep going, keep talking me through it. What are you, feel what are you feeling at the moment? Spikes on the back. Or something like that. So it's like cylindrical, but with spikes. Got... Can you, can you recognise it as being anything? It feels a bit like a, um, a plane. Oh, like, a, like an aeroplane? Yeah. OK. Well... Like... Yeah, just like a... Yeah, toy plane when you were a kid or something. OK. Well, just... Can you find the wings? Are there wings on it? Yeah. Yeah? yeah. You're feeling them now? Yeah, pointy things, yeah. <laughs> and so the spike, I guess, was like the tail? Fin yeah. of the of the of the yeah. plane. So does it point at the other end? Is there like a nose to yeah. it as well? Yeah. Can you feel windows? I mean, are you feeling like? No. You're not getting windows. Okay, no. but you're getting the shape of a plane. So what's so you've got the nose at the other end. Yeah. Do have a look at it as you're doing this because it's really interesting. If you look at it, you'll see there's nothing. You know, you know there's nothing there. I'm sure, but you can see. What's that like? It's just weird, man. <laughs> huh? <laughs> and you can all see from the back there is nothing. You can see there's nothing in there. So is there anything else, or is it just an aeroplane? No, I can just feel an aeroplane. OK. All right, well, why don't you leave the aeroplane where it is? Bring your hand out for us. That's great, Adam. Thank you. Um, yeah. <laughs> so, look, while you were asleep, your mum drew a picture and has been sending this to you sort of mentally, telepathically, through the interval. Um, before we get too excited, it probably won't, won't be an aeroplane, but there should be a good connection between the two. So it might be something to do with travel. It might be something like a, like a car, you know, or a lorry or a bus or something like that. We'll have a look and see what it is. Um, but... I chose your mum rather than your sister here as well, because you'll have the longest connection with your mum. So, uh, we'll see. Do you want to... Um... Oh, Christine, you didn't tell anybody what this was, did you? No. no? Great, OK. I'll let you have a look first, but I'm quite intrigued to see what this is. Maybe you can show the camera as well. Ooh, ah! 
That is absolutely spot on. Well done. Let me just show the camera again. That is an aeroplane. I'll show you back there as well. That is, uh, that is a, definitely an aeroplane. Thank you, Adam and Christine. Thank you both. It was really good. Right there you go. Thank you so much. When we are at our most vulnerable, we do tend to stop thinking as rationally, and we tend to grasp at whatever feels like it'll give us comfort, which is fair enough, but it can be exploited. And there was a really important point first put forward in the 18th century by a philosopher called David Hume, who said, extraordinary claims demand extraordinary evidence. And all that means is, if you are claiming something that's extraordinary, so something that flies in the face of science, like talking to the dead, for example, and you wish to be taken seriously, firstly, you have to come up with the evidence yourself to back up your own claim. It's not enough just to insist that other people have to try and disprove it, which you could never do. You can never prove that something isn't true. That's trying to prove a negative, so it wouldn't work anyway. So you've got to come up with the evidence yourself to back up your claim, and it's got to be really strong evidence because your claim is so strong. So if, for example, a magician saws a woman in half every night on stage during his show and then starts saying, that isn't a trick, I do it for real. I really do it. I take a woman, any woman, I can do it with any woman. I saw her in half, I use any saw. I pull her into two and then I put her back together and I heal her up and I'm doing it for real. It isn't a trick and he expects you to believe him. You would say, well, come on, you've got to come up with some pretty strong evidence that you're doing that for real. If you said that, and then he said, you want evidence? Come see my show. I do it every night. That doesn't count. That's not evidence. That's the very thing you're questioning, right? So you would say, well, no, that's all on your terms. Come do the same thing under controlled conditions, and then I'll absolutely believe you. That just means, you know, conditions that are fair for everybody. So if you say you can do it with any woman, we'll provide a woman. Great. If you say you can use any saw, let us provide the saw, and so on. And if you set all that up, I make it absolutely fair for everybody. And then he says, well, I'm not going to do it now because you're sceptical and the energy's all wrong. You can say, well, stop wasting our time, you big baby. So with that in mind, you're all up here because you have a genuine interest in the possibility of mediumship. I would love to show you how it is possible for me or somebody with a similar skill base to seemingly know things about people that you've known who have passed on without and I promise you, any psychic ability, let alone any contact with the dead. Are you happy for me to do this, first of all? Yes? It won't be with all of you, it'll be with a tiny handful of you, but I hope nonetheless that you all take something from this, all right? And we don't know each other, do we? No. We do not know each other. For that reason, you've written down your first names on cards, which have been collected here in this bowl, so thank you so much for doing that. I'll be plucking your names out as we go along, so I don't know who I'm gonna get, thank you. Um, and also, as we do this, I'm gonna write things down on bits of paper, on cards, rather, um, which will get projected up onto the wall behind you, Please don't look at what I've written. I'll show you, but only after you've given your answers. And just have a quick check. It's always worth doing this nowadays that I'm not wearing any sort of earpiece. Can you see in my ear there? Mm -hmm. Nothing there? Happy with that one too? All right, it's important you know I'm not being fed any information. Not that it would help me anyway, all right, as you'll see. Okay, with that in mind, let's begin. There is, <clears throat> there is a lady stood on the stairs at the moment. About halfway up, she's got her hand on the railing. She's wearing like a pinky blue um, jumper with a V-neck, probably in her 50s, maybe. I'm gonna ask her to come down. She says she's coming through. She's coming through for a lady uh, with a name. Uh, re, uh, begins with an R. Rian, Rian, Re or Rebecca? Is there a Rebecca, or is it? Are you Rebecca? Could you stand up for me? Maybe, maybe, maybe she's coming through for you. Let me just. Um, uh, if you can stay right there. That's fine. You can stay where you are. Let me just give you that. Could you take that back? Oh, thank you. All right. So, um, so this is a lady in her fifties. Is there anybody that you, first of all, don't say who it is, is there somebody you can think that this maybe could be a lady in her 50s that you would have met her? It would be somebody that you would know. Yeah. Someone come to mind? Okay. Um, 
Oh, she gave me a name. Hang on, let me just try and get this. Uh, uh, I'm guessing she might have been perhaps, I don't know, maybe grandmother or something like that, or, yeah. What was, do you know, what, what was your grandma's name? Lillian. Again? Lillian. Lillian. Okay, well, I've sort of got Lucy and Lily, so I mean, this, I, think this, I think this is probably her. So I think, so Lillian is, she's nodding ahead, she's nodding ahead. So Lillian is coming through now for you, uh, Rebecca, so that she can give you, she can say things to you through me that I couldn't know as proof that she's coming through, all right? It isn't proof, Rebecca. It isn't even the flimsiest form of evidence. It simply doesn't count because these are not controlled conditions for such a claim. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, but nonetheless... She's saying, yes. Okay. She's asking if you if you got the um, if you got the letter. She's saying she's asking, did you get the letter? Is what she's saying. Yeah. Obviously, this means something to you. Um, I wasn't sure what that was. What what is it? What what letter is she talking about? Um, before she died, she wrote me a letter because I was only one. You were only one. Oh, you were little. And she wrote, so she wrote it for you to read? Yeah. So you did get it and you did read it? When I was 18, she gave it to my mum and said, don't let her read it until she's 18. Then that's what she's asking about. So she's asking about this letter as partly to ask and partly as evidence that she's, that she's coming through for you, which she isn't, and you understand that. So, look, she's just taking a step back now. I think this is all we're going to hear from her. Sometimes it is so brief. So I think you can probably take a seat for me now, Rebecca. Thank you very much. Uh, let me just take her name um, out of here. Uh, there's, a, there's a David on top. David? David, stand up for me. Thank you. If there's any other Davids, feel free to stand as well. Again, if you can pass the microphone back. And forgive me, David, if nobody comes through for you. Again, same thing, all right? Um, if no... No, the, the lady is for you. Sorry. Um, okay, this is an older lady as well, possibly. Yeah, yeah, maybe grandmother, perhaps. Oh, I have a name. She says, uh, you, you haven't known this woman, she's saying, for quite a long time. She can remember how old you were when you last saw her. Um, if you went to a... If you did go to a medium, is there anybody you would hope would come through for you? My grandma. Your grandma. Do you know how old you were when you last saw her? About 12. About 12. What was her name? Evelyn. Evelyn. We have her here, right? She's right here. Uh, if I think back to my grandmother, I can remember like things that happened to her. Is there something you can remember or something you were told about your grandmother, something I could ask, something that wouldn't happen to everyone's grandmother or something not everyone's grandmother would have done? Yeah. OK, if you can think of that for me, I'm going to ask her to tell me something, but what I find happens in these situations is that she will tell me exactly the same thing that you're thinking of because of the connection between you two at the moment, right? So let me ask her just something that happened when, she, when you would have known her. OK, she's, she's telling me, um, and she isn't telling me anything, you understand this, I'm making this up, I'm lying to you. <laughs> she's telling me, uh, I'm going to write this down here. <laughs> OK, slow down, slow down a second, one second. Hang on, one second, I'm just going <laughs> to... Hang on a minute, uh, don't look behind you, because it's up on the wall, but don't look, right? I'm just going to ask her a bit more, for a bit more information about this. Got it, OK. All right. Where did your mind go? When I said for you to think of something that happened, what, what, what did you think of? Um, a story my mum told me about my mum and my grandma when they went on holiday. Where did they go? They went to Gibraltar. Well, they went to Gibraltar. What well, happened? Well, I think they went to Spain, but they went to Gibraltar for a day trip. What happened? She got bit by a monkey on Gibraltar. <laughs> <laughs> this is precisely what she's told me. Again, I got bitten by a monkey at uh, the Gibraltar Rock. She's heading back. I'll tell you what, I've got, probably just got time for one more. Uh, oh, no, I won't. No, somebody is pushing their way forward. OK, there's... Um, uh, OK, I have a lady... There's probably quite a forthright character in life, I would think. There's a lady in her 70s, I would think, early 70s, asking for... I'm sorry? For jo uh, Georgia? Georgina? Is there a Georgia or a Georgina? Could you stand up for me? Thank you. Um, so this is a lady in her 70s. Um, I was going to just get a... Have you got the microphone? Can we pass the microphone across? Uh, so this is a lady uh, in her 70s. Again, have a little think. I've got a name. She's given me some information about herself. Uh, she says, uh, could this be... Um, 
uh, grandmother as well, you're thinking? Yeah. Uh, she's got, how old, you may not know, do you know how old your grandma was when she died? I think she was 72. And her name? Doris. Doris, okay. Again, yeah. we have her here, which we don't, all right? Is there something um, she's saying? I've got a few people coming up on both sides now, which is making this a little bit tricky, but I just want to focus on Doris here for a moment. Um, she's saying she, uh, she got sort of brown hair, which is probably maybe unusual for a lady in her 70s, is that right? Yeah. She, um, she didn't, she's not, not grey, no. unusually, not grey hair. I can see her, she's very clearly here, which she isn't, again. I've got um, people coming up on both sides. Uh, she's saying she had a dog, that you'd remember her dog. Yes. Is that right? You'd remember her dog, you liked her dog. People coming up on both sides. I've got a lot of people, I think anybody now that any of you were hoping to contact, I now have coming up on stage, on both sides, as well as the deceased friends and relatives of 2,000 people behind me. <laughs> I also have making their way up, both sides uh, up here onto the stage. They're all talking at the same time, but I want to get this right, because they're all saying the same thing. So let me just, I just want to get this right. It's obviously important, because they're all saying the same thing. Okay, thank you. All right, I've got it. They are saying, if they ever get the chance to communicate with the living, they promise you they will not do it through some needy showbiz performer. They promise you that. No one has the right to trample on your memories of people that you've loved. It's, it's just disgusting. Did you know her dog's name? Zelda. Thank you so much, all of you. Thank you so much for letting me do this. I really, really do appreciate it. Thank you so much, thank you. Thank you so much. I'm gonna ask, uh, let's go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Eight, nine. Can you nine just stand yourselves down here? And can the rest of you head back? Thank you so very much for letting me do that. Please give them a hand as they go back. Thank you so much. Uh, what's your name? Emma. Nice to meet you. Emma, and you are? Johnny. Johnny. Emma and Johnny, let's go. Johnny, can you stand behind that, uh, behind that table there for me? Thank you so much. Can the rest of you just gather around me here? I just need you to check something, and it's so important. I've, I know I've said this once, but I want you to check again that I'm not wearing any kind of earpiece. Stick your fingers in, have a proper look. Go on, stick your have a proper look. Go on, oh, you're actually doing, you're actually doing that. People don't normally bother. <laughs> yeah. Go on, stick your fingers in, have a proper look. It's so important you know now that what's happening, that I'm doing for real, right? I'm not being fed any information. Two years ago, I started a memorization project in anticipation of the finale of this show. I memorized two iconic works of British fiction. The first one I learned was this, the complete works of Shakespeare. I learned these, I have memorized these, this particular edition as well, uh, pretty much word for word. So that's the first thing, complete works of Shakespeare. Any Americans in the audience, uh, very famous novelist. <laughs> Next iconic work of British fiction are our bus timetables. Uh, I've learned number one to number 799, so nearly 800 bus routes. And just the routes, just the stops, not the times as well, otherwise that'd be mental. Um, was it Johnny as well? Was yeah, it? Johnny. Johnny, thank you. So Johnny, there's a horn here, which you'll be sounding in a minute, pressing the button at the top, a bowl of rice, and some talcum powder. So knock yourself out, I'll explain those in a minute. Um, can you gather yourselves around here, so you've each got a bowl in front of you, just four down this side, four down that side, lovely. Uh, thank you very much. Yeah, just bring yourselves around. Four on each side. Thank you so much. Uh, the bowls all have dice in. You have one die each. So if you give them a few rolls, just so you're happy, they're all regular dice and so on, which they are. While you're doing that, in the audience, if you have calculators, can you please turn them on for me? Turn on your calculators. Uh, if you have an iPhone, please turn it landscape. This is really important. It'll open up the scientific mode. It means you can deal with longer strings of numbers, which you will need. Thank you, good. Next, a couple of Rubik's cubes. I'm gonna hand them out on this side. Uh, if you get them, we'll maybe start towards the back. If you just mix them up and just pass them forward. Thank you so much. Would you mind taking them? Thank you. Just make sure people pass them forward when you're from the back. Lovely. And if you end up with them here at the front, can you stick them just sort of here on the, on the top for me? Thank you. So I can grab them. Good. Okay, while that's going on on this side, on this side, I'd like somebody to write down a 10-digit number. If somebody can write down a 10-digit number for me, please. Thank you. So Usher, please, pen and paper. That'd be lovely. So while they're writing down a 10-digit number, we are going to use these dice to generate an 8-digit number. Uh, so basically, we'll roll them in a minute again, and I'll take a line down this side and then back up this side. So at the moment, it would go three, two, two, five, one, two, five, two would be our eight-digit number. So pick them up for me. We're going to roll them again. Uh, this time when we roll them, though, I'm going to write whatever we get on this board up here, and you have to write this number. You have to put this number into your calculators. So get ready to type in this next eight-digit number, all right? So go on, give them one more roll. Take whatever we get this time. Uh, so the first one is four, yes? So four, the next one? Six. Six, next? Three. Three. 
Two. Two. Six. Six. Make sure you're typing these in. Four. Four. Two. 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 Is it two two at the end? You're both two. Yeah, lovely. Two two. All right. So make sure you got that. Four six three two six four two two. Make sure you have that typed in. Brilliant. You have generated a random eight-digit number. You've done it perfectly. You may now head back and watch the rest of the show from your seats. But thank you so much. Please give them a hand. That way, if you don't mind, our random number generators. Okay. Here we go. When I was uh, at secondary school, I was a member of the music school gang, <laughs> also known as the Puff Gang, less charitably, by the rest of the school. And um, around this sort of age, so kind of like sort of 15, 16, that kind of age, um, I, I thought that I was, slash, really, this is sort of 15, 16. Is that the Rubik's Cube's back? It is, thank you so much. Um, hang on, Rubik's Cube's are back. Thank you. Uh, all right, good. Thank you for that. Uh, yes, good, lovely. So, around that age, 15, 16, I thought that I was, slash really wanted to be, um, Ren McCormack. Any of you know Ren McCormack? Ren McCormack was the Kevin Bacon character in the film Footloose. It was very popular at the time. It's kind of how I saw myself at that age. This kind of infamous outsider figure, earning the respect of his peers through the gift of dance. <laughs> And here I am at the age of 15, rocking the sateen trousers. Hope you enjoy them. And I did have a nickname at school as well. It wasn't, it wasn't Wren or Footloose or anything. It was, quite simply, Dig Brain. Uh, <laughs> was my nickname as well. Thank you for laughing and yeah, bring it all back. And I was called Dig Brain because I could do things like a Rubik's Cube behind my back and mental maths tricks and human calculator stuff and that sort of thing. So I thought I would show you how I earned the title Dick Brain at school. So, Johnny, can you pick up the horn for me? In a minute, you are going to sound that horn. It's the button on the top. When you do, um, a countdown will start. So I normally do this in 10 minutes, but I'm going to try tonight to do it in nine and a half, uh, just to kind of beat my own record. The last minute will come up as a countdown on the back wall. When that countdown reaches zero, that is the end of the show. All right, there's no encore. There's no, you know, it just finishes. That's the final moment of the show, and that gets to zero. And I think we have everything in place. The Rubik's Cubes are back. Thank you for doing that. We have a number generated by the dice. Uh, hopefully now someone's got a 10-digit number they're hanging on to. And Johnny has the horn. Good. OK. Uh, when I give you the signal in a minute, nice and loud and clear. Actually, sorry, one. If... Or a lot of... A lot of you will still be at school, or um, college, university even, if you are a bit of a dick brain, or you're just made to feel like one every day when you go in. Can I just promise you that all of those really cool kids, the, the sporty, cool guys and the skinny, pretty girls, all grew up to have the most boring adult lives and jobs, because they never had to forge their own path when they were younger. They never had to find their own way when they were little. And if you are having to do that now, it is tough. But I promise you, you grew up to have the most brilliant and creative adult life. Yeah, who ever heard of a, of a musician or an artist who just fitted in really easily at school? Nobody. So, so dick brains unite, yes? <laughs> Okay, thank you. Johnny, sound the horn on the count of three. I was going to... Sorry, put it down. That's fine, thank you. Put it down. Okay, first dick brain trick. Don't look at them, but it's the numbers behind me on the board. The eight-digit number. Don't look at them. Look at me for a minute. Can you remember the eight-digit number generated by the dice without looking at them? Okay, you can look at them now. The number is 4632642. Backwards, 22462364. Most of it would have all is to alternate, so give me a big shout if this is right. Uh, first, last, second in second, in third in third, in, I'll, I'll end up in the middle. I'll end up in the middle. It goes... Four, two, six, two, three, four, two, six. Yes? Yes, thank you so much. Jesus. Thank you. Next. Next dick brain trick is the memorized bus route. So look, these first three digits of our eight-digit number will give us the bus route, all right? Four, six, three. Do you want to look it up? It's in the blue book. Four, six, three. Uh, now, you do not have a four, six, three round here, or at least not one that I know. 463 I'm doing here is near London. Can you stand in front of the mic for me with it, please? Um, so if I get this right, just shout out nice, clear yes into the mic. The first stop of 463 bus route is Coolston South Station, correct? Yeah. Yes, thank you very much. I, I have done this. So here's how you can do it. And by the way, you can feign enthusiasm if you like, Johnny. I've learned 800 of these. <laughs> 
Here's how you can do it. You link pictures together. You turn everything into a picture that you can visualize and you link it to the next thing. So you have to turn the number into a picture as well. So that's a little bit more tricky. You do it by turning each digit into a letter. And then you make a word out of the letters. So four, I use an R, because there's an R at the end of four, right? I use an R. Uh, six, I use a, a, a P, because it looks a bit like a, a P sort of on its side, like a P. And uh, three, I use an M, because it looks like a three on its side, right? So you've got R, P, M. You make a, a picture from that, either by adding vowel sounds to make a word, or I just use a record player, because it's RPMs, right? So my image that gives me the first bus stop is a record player, but it's as it's going round, it's, it's making a fan move. It's, uh, it's sort of operating a fan fan that is cooling, it's cooling um, uh, uh, like a little den, like a work den in a station, right? This is a weird image, but it gives me cools den station, right? It gives me cools and station, which is, the first, uh, which is the first stop. Now, to continue, I just continue with this story in my head. I link to the next image. Nicholas Lindhurst from Only Fools and Horses, the actor, walks out of the station and down the road. Next stop is Lindhurst Road, yes? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and he walks out to a big clock tower, which is being mounted by some animals. That's it, isn't it? It's, it's, it's Clock Tower Farm, but it's a place called The Mount in Clock Tower Farm. No. Pardon? No. Clock Tower Farm, The Mount. It's close. <laughs> Clock Tower Farm, The Mount. That is what it is. What does it say? Clock House Farm. Clock House Farm, the mound. All right, sorry, OK. All right, then he goes up to it and he paints it green. Uh, Woodcoat wood coat green is the next stop. Yeah. Yeah, I'm just going to rattle through these now. Shout yes for each one that's right, OK? It goes um, Wallington Station, Forecourt. Yeah. Wallington Green. Yeah. Beddington uh, uh, Church. Yeah. Beddington Asda. Yeah. Beddington Lane, Jessup's Way. Yeah. Mitchfield, Mitch, um, Mitcham East Station. Yeah. The Wide Way. Yeah. Finishing at Pollard's Hill at 6.28 in the morning? Yeah. Yes, thank you so much. I've done this, all right. Good. Thank you. All right, next one. Next is how you apply this. So, here's how you apply it. Pick up the book for me. This is The Complete Works of Shakespeare, turned to page 264. They should teach this stuff in schools because it's exactly what you need when it comes to regurgitating information, which is what we need for exams, sadly, nowadays, right? I knew this stuff when I was little, and I don't mean to show off, but I got one of the top marks in the year in the country for English A-level precisely by using this technique. Have you got it, page 264? Yeah. All right, so first word on that page. Have a look at it for me. The first word on page 264 is... First word is the word hearts. Yeah. Yes. Uh, if I can see it, it goes hearts, comma, and hymen did our hands, new line, unite, co-mutual with most sacred bands. Yeah. Yeah, thank you very much. I have, I have done this for real. Uh, actually, go to another page. Just do another page. Got a bit of time. Just give me any, any other page. What have you got? What are you looking at? What are you looking uh, at? 453. 453. Just look at page 453. Top one on the page. I'll just give it to you quickly. Four, uh, is the word... 453. Um, birds? Yeah. The la Let me give you the last one on the page. Just quickly get the last one on the page is... Birds, my fairy lord, this must be done with haste. Horses! Yeah. Yeah! Thank you so much! Thank you so much. I'll let you head now. Thank you very much. Draw it that way if you don't mind. Johnny, everybody! Thank you so much! <laughs> Please, you're enjoying it. Next, uh, next is, the, uh, is the rice. This is a bit of a weird one. Uh, the rice, right? 22. I have to pluck out 22 grains of rice from the bowl in one go. OK, so just to explain, if I got home early from school, I would, used to, and my parents were still at work, I'd go next door to Auntie Gwen's house, used to call her Auntie Gwen, and I'd ask to play with the rice. And she'd bring out like this big bowl of rice, or a big jar of rice, rather. She'd be in the kitchen, she'd call out numbers, and I'd have to pluck out that number of grains of rice in one go. I got really good at it. Got really good at it, and then I stopped doing it because of the whole dick brain thing, right? And then, but years later, when I was coming up with ideas for this show, I thought you might want to see this. So, for your entertainment, I will pluck out 22 grains of rice from the bowl. Not 21, not 23, ladies and gentlemen, but 22 grains of rice from the bowl in one go. All right, so, uh, dick brain facts about 22. Uh, there are 22 letters in the Hebrew alphabet. There are 22 cards in the tarot deck. Joseph Heller wrote the book Catch 22 in 1961. It became a popular film in 1970. It was top of the cinema charts for uh, five weeks. Um, Paul Weller wrote the album called 22 Dreams, which contained 22 songs, including one called 22 Dreams. So there you go, some dick brain facts. 
about 22. Um, I do have to talcum powder my hands, otherwise the rice just, you know, kind of sticks. I don't have any control at all. I'm a little bit sick of hearing people say, oh, you just had the rice there and you've just put in the rice in your hands. So, could somebody stand up here, just so you can verify, this is just talcum powder. Can you see that? Yep. That's all that is. I'm not putting any rice in my hands. Are you happy with that? It's just so the rice doesn't stick, yes? Yeah, lovely, okay, thank you, good. All right, so, 22. 22 grains of rice from the bowl. Okay, here we go. Come on then, come on. 22 grains of rice, come on. Come on, come on, do it for mommy. Here we go. 22 grains of rice from the bowl. Here we go. 22 grains of rice from the bowl. Uh, from the bowl. 20, ah, uh, got one wrong. Got one wrong. Make it a, I'm one out. Let me just move the bowl so you can see them. I'm one out. One, two, three, four, five, six. I'm not one out. Seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22. There it is. 22 grains of rice. Thank you, Auntie Gwen. Good. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> next. Uh, next. Okay, next is the human calculator. Human calculator. Adding up numbers faster or as fast in my dick brain as you can on a calculator. Somebody got a 10-digit number now. Is there an usher with that person? Can you give me a wave if you've got a torch? Lovely. Hopefully you've got a microphone as well. So can this person, you're going to, right, you're going to call out your 10-digit number in a moment. Now, you all have this number in your calculators. 4632-6422. Press plus. You're about to add to this number, generated by the dice, a 10-digit number written by somebody in the audience. All right? So when you get this, type it one digit at a time, then press equal so you add them on your calculators. I'm going to add them in my dick brain. Here we go. First uh, number, please. Go, nice and clearly. Off you go. Seven. Seven. Next. Nine. Nine. Make sure you're all getting these. Two. Two. Keep going. Nine. Nine again. Nine. 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 Here we go. Seven. Oh, okay. Seven. Two. Two. Yep. Four. Four. Last one. Six. Six. Press equals. The total is 7,976,323,673. Am I right? Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Good. Thank you. Next. Next. I just run out of time. Ah, oh, I did the extra page in the book. Ah, that's my fault. Okay, I was showing off. No, I, I, don't, I can't do two Rubik's Cubes behind my back in a minute, so I will do one Rubik's Cube. Maybe not, maybe not this one. I'll do the other one. Um, oh, whoever did these is a fucking sociopath, you can tell. <laughs> Okay, but behind my back, all right? Behind my back there, here we go, behind my back. One Rubik's Cube behind the back, here we go, here we go. <laughs> Went to see Darren Brown. 30 seconds. How was he? Yeah, he was all right. What was his big finale? He did a Rubik's Cube. <laughs> what a dick brain. Yes, he was, actually. It's funny you should say that. One uh, red cross there, green cross at the bottom, L shape there, 20. red L shape, that's it, done. Yes, yes? No, <sighs> no I... No, I Ten. have. I have. Look, Nine. I've matched Eight. that side to that Seven. side. Can you see that? Six. Five. And I've matched that Four. side to that side. Three. And that side to that two. side. And One. that side to that side. And those two match there. And those two match there. That's how a dick brain does a Rubik's cube. I'm a dick brain. I'm Darren Brown. Good night. Coming back through. <laughs> Amanda loves stand up, grab the microphone, love. Your grandma, she's she's come back for the end of the show, so I need a nice clear yes or no from you, right? It's gonna be loud and clear. She's saying, I need a yes or no from you, your phone number. Is it oh oh is your phone number? Is it oh is your is your phone number 07976-323668? Yes. Yeah, fuck me, I'm real! Good night! <laughs>
Good evening, I am live at Leeds Bradford Airport and tonight's show follows one man, one ordinary man who may or may not make the decision to embrace the present and live life to the full. A decision which at just coming up to 10 o'clock on Wednesday the 8th of September could apply to any of us. This man however is so terrified of flying that he hasn't been on a plane for 10 years and in the show I aim to make him brave enough to volunteer to land a plane that he believes is about to fall out of the sky. What will he do? What would you do? Welcome to the show. In life, when we slip up, we just give up. We live on this beautiful planet for a tiny dot of time. The chances of us even being born are so minute as to be practically zero. Our lives are a miracle. I strongly believe that engaging with life is about understanding that it's the choices we make right now that are important, not the habits of our past. Tonight, I'm going to show this man how extraordinary he can be. But to do so, I'll have to push him to the extreme. What you do you want to do? I want you to land the aeroplane. In a little under an hour, you will see one man faced with a decision that could change his world. A month ago, Matt Galley was stuck in a rut. His life was kind of going nowhere, and I placed before him a series of extreme opportunities that would allow him to engage more fully with his life. And tonight, you will see him make his biggest decision yet, whether or not to be a true hero at 30,000 feet. I started looking for my potential hero several months ago. Matt was one of thousands of applicants who put themselves forward to take part in what they thought was a new game show I'd be hosting. Which, in a sense, it is, just not quite in the way that they think. I was looking for somebody living an unremarkable life. And one man seemed to tick all the boxes. This man, Matt. He's like most of us. I like going shopping, like going into Leeds, going to the cinema, maybe play on a few computer games. He's stuck in a rut. My job at the minute, I work as an insurance advisor. It's not dead-end sort of things, but because I've been there so, for so long, things are starting to repeat. And held back by his fears. I have a fear of flying. I don't like the way it makes me feel, so I just prefer not to do it. He seemed perfect, but I had one more test, an exercise known as the bystander effect. Under the pretense of completing additional forms, I put him in a room with three actors he believes are other candidates for my show. An emergency situation is staged. Our actors have been told not to react. The test is to see whether Matt will stand up and speak out. If you've seen someone have an accident or collapse in the street and been aware that everyone is just watching or passing by, you'll appreciate this natural human urge not to be the one to take action. Matt is the classic passive bystander, perfect for the journey I want to take him on. We secretly contacted Matt's friends and family and with their help began watching his every move. I gave myself 30 days to put in place a series of opportunities which Matt can use to change his life forever. Matt works at an insurance call centre. Matt's um, normal daily routine would be get up, have something to eat, go to work. As soon as he comes home, he just goes up to his room. And I think that he feels safe in that. At 23 years old, he still lives with his mother, Alison, her boyfriend, Dave, and Liv, his girlfriend. He's got this idea in his head of this dream home, but he never seems to do anything about it. He does have ambition. Well, he did want to join the police force. But he's never actually been for an interview or taken a serious step in that direction. I think the reason he's not ever done anything about that is because he thinks that he'll never be able to pass the exams. His self-confidence is very low, and it also affects his other relationships. It's very rare that he'd show his mum affection. They'd never have a hug or a, a cuddle or anything. We just don't communicate anymore. 
That's my biggest worry, is that he, he will always have this defeatist attitude about himself. And that's what I find the most frustrating thing about it. Sorry. <laughs> Matt and you and I are right now, this second, living the only lives we have. You wouldn't go on it? No. Why not? Sometimes we need something to happen, an event or a moment that shakes us up and forces us to take a good look at ourselves. I'm just going to pull in to get some fuel. Yeah, yeah. If you can get me 20 pence of the edges whilst I'm filling up and then pay for pump seven. Yeah. A shock to the system can make us realise there's so much more of which we're capable. And when uh, Mr Black Cow's done with his uh, Black Cow, Fucking hands on your head! Mobile phone! Go. Come on! Mobile phone! You empty the fucking till! Quick! No mucking about! Put your oh, fucking hands on your you. head! Do you understand? Same goes for you! Don't even fucking look. What's your name, mate? Matt. Matt? Yeah? You must be shitting yourself, Matt! What do you do for a living? I'm working in insurance. Working in insurance, yeah? Fucking battery head! Come on! If I shoot you now! You've done nothing in your life, you fucking doormat! You've done nothing! Right, don't move! No one move! Fucking monkey. <laughs> 500 quid, that phone. I pressed the panic button. Does that mean the police are coming? You all right, yeah. You all right? Yeah, yeah. I'm a bit shaken and all, but... I'm sending in fake police to check he's OK. Police are here now. This may have been an extreme measure, but I wanted to shock Matt out of his passive life and make him start to think about the choices he is making right now. Hi, sir. I understand this bit of robbery. Is anybody, is anybody all right? Is anybody yeah. there? Matt's countdown has begun, and in 30 days, he's going to be faced with a choice between occupying the world he knows now, in which he is a passive bystander, and a new world where he's a hero. That choice will be the measure of his life. Do you know that, like, you know, like, everything can happen to him, and now he's going to react to him. Tell me I don't know what I'm like, but I thought that would really change him here, when he's gone old enough to come in and stuff. Now, it's not my place to make Matt into someone different. Throughout this process, I'll only ever be giving him opportunities. He'll take what he needs to then move forward in a way that comes from within him and allows his true capabilities to emerge. Being held at gunpoint made Matt start to question his life. Now I want to give him the chance to find answers. So I'm sneaking into his back garden. 
With the help of Matt's girlfriend, we've hidden cameras and a discreet speaker in his bedroom. He's been asleep for two and a half hours. Matt. Matt. You're having a dream. Now, Matt, you need to get up and get dressed and come outside into the back garden. Get up, get dressed, and come outside. Matt has a suggestible personality, which means by having woken him up and told him he was still asleep, I was able to put him into a dreamlike state, which is perfect for talking to his unconscious mind. I'm going to give him the tools to allow him to subconsciously change the way he looks at himself. I want you to listen to this, Matt. Magicians have always been obsessed with the idea of creating something out of nothing. And the highest form of that is to make a life, a perfect life, appear from thin air. And I've always longed to witness an event like that for real. And then I realized that I have. The chances of all the circumstances being in place that would lead to two particular people meeting and then them falling in love are supremely minute. And then, if they come together to have children, the chance of one particular sperm fertilizing one particular egg and then one particular life emerging is even more unlikely. And Matthew, this improbability multiplies generation after generation down through your great-grandparents and your grandparents until finally, by chance, your mother Alison meets and falls in love with a man called Richard. And then from their decision to come together and have children and against those impossible odds, it's you that's born. Your life is a miracle. Matt, there are 27 days, 19 hours and six minutes until the end of your world as you know it. It's now time for you to return to bed and sleep nice and deeply. In the morning, this should all just feel like a dream to Matt. He got back into bed. He cuddled up to me and he said, I love you so much. Um, and he was like, I want to make a future with you. And the next morning, he commented on how he was in an extremely good mood and how he felt like he could do anything. The next day, Matt goes to work, blissfully unaware that his real journey is now underway. We secretly follow him to see if my words have started to take effect. When he gets right to his front door that night, there's a glitch in his routine. On a normal day, he'd go through that door, up to his room and switch on his TV. But not today. We follow him as best we can and catch up with him on a nearby golf course where he sits and writes for an hour and a half. Something is definitely beginning to change. But there's a long way to go before Matt can be put to the ultimate test on a plane at 30,000 feet. It takes real courage to break out of our everyday routines and do something extraordinary, but when we do, we really come alive. In 40 minutes and at 30,000 feet, you will see Matt Galley's world shaken as he has to make the most terrifying decision of his life. I need to pay Matt another visit and speak to his subconscious to further encourage him down his own path of self-discovery. This time I want to take him out of his comfort zone and have him embrace the notion of risk. Matt. This second night it's easy to keep him in the dream state as his mind has learned from the previous night. Matt. You're dreaming. Get up. Get dressed. And come outside to the front garden. 
dress warmly. Matt will feel like it's all a dream. He'll be in the perfect state to be open to suggestion. a bite force at 335 pounds per square inch. Think about that for a second. Do you know what animal has the strongest bite? Crocodile. They come in at 5,000 pounds per square inch. So that's what clamps down on your leg. Come and see this. Place your hand just gently on his back. I want you to feel him. It's okay. It's okay. Put your hand on his back. Come a little higher, a little higher near the head. Come away from his tail. Feel its power. Feel the power of that animal. You take your hand away now. Crocodiles and alligators attack their prey before the prey has a chance to react. They move from standing so quickly that the prey doesn't have a chance. They don't even know they're coming. Their senses are amplified, wide open, and attuned. They know what they want, and they get it without thinking, without hesitation. And have you ever seen one clamp its teeth down on its prey? They hold on, they don't let go. They have tenacity, they have determination. And that's important because in life, when we try to do things, often we slip up and then we just give up instead of getting back up and getting back on where we left off. And that's what's important, tenacity, persevering, determination. Close your eyes for me. You can take a little step back if you like. Now, Matt, you like the idea of becoming a policeman. But I want you just to imagine now that you're turning up at a policeman's house. You open the door and you step inside. I want you to walk around inside the policeman's home. And as you walk around, I want you to make yourself at home. I want you to start to feel it being natural, it being you. Enjoy it, absorb the feeling of being a policeman a successful policeman, and feel brave. Now you can open your eyes. Let's go back to the car. Matt will only remember this bizarre event as if he dreamt it. When he got back into bed, I don't think he said anything to me. He was just shivering. <laughs> then he woke up the next morning and he said that he'd been having some very strange dreams about Darren. He said, I'm not sure what's real and what's a dream. He said, did, did you hear someone whispering? And I said, no, why? And he said, I just remember someone saying South Yorkshire, South Yorkshire in Thames Valley. I said, no, I didn't hear anything. And then he said, well, anyway, um, I've, I've, um, I've emailed the Thames Valley police this morning and the South Yorkshire police. <laughs> The next day, Matt went to work as if nothing had happened. But now we should really start to see him coming out of his shell.
It's 5.30 p.m. Matt's left the office and is on his way home, but in the back of his mind is the idea of going to a policeman's house. I've placed some keys and a wallet on his route home where he can't miss them. But will he take the bait? Inside the wallet, there's a deputy commissioner's badge and his address. It's up to Matt to choose what to do. But I've sent a cabbie in to offer him a lift. Yo, mate. Without hesitation, Matt gets in. Give me a second, I'll tell you about that. No problem, buddy. Earlier, we dressed this house with enough props to utterly convince Matt that it's a deputy commissioner's home. I'll be secretly watching the action from the garage. She's just talking to the cabbie. Can you just hang on? Yeah, I'm here. I'm waiting for you. Yeah, I'm waiting for you. Possibly at this point, he's just thinking of returning the keys. But there's no one home. So with the visualisation exercise from last night at the back of his mind, he makes the decision to break in. I also want him to experience the thrill of putting himself at personal risk, because that's going to be important for him later on. So we're now going to bring our policeman home. The countdown continues towards Matt's moment on a 737 aircraft where he'll have to choose between being a bystander and becoming a hero.
Unaware that I've been putting these opportunities in his path, Matt is being deeply affected by recent events. The changes aren't going unnoticed. So you're telling us that you actually went to a police superintendent's house, let yourself in, made a drink and sat down and watched his television? Yes. Yeah, that's what I did. It's just not something that, you, that I'd ever expect him to come home and say he'd done. I was sat on the settee and, and he came and he sat down and, and he gave me a hug. Matt gave his mum a hug and told her that he loved her and, and I was just like, Whoa. I was like, what? I just, I couldn't believe it. I just thought, that's so nice. Then he stayed, sat with me instead of moving away and that was more relevant to me than the actual hug itself that he stayed where he was, he stayed with that contact with me. So that, that was lovely, yeah. Now I need to crank it up a level. <laughs>For 30 days, I've been secretly filming one man and taking him through a series of challenges in the hope that he can discover, like all of us, that he is capable of so much more than he would ever believe. And in 30 minutes, he's going to need to draw on all that he's learned if he's going to take control of a 737 aircraft. Yet again, I'm placing an opportunity to seize the moment in Matt's path. Today, he has the chance to inspire and spread joy if he finds the inspirational words to seemingly change the life of my van driver, who I've placed with a broken down van at the end of his street. Are you all right? Yeah. Living life fully is not just about fulfilling ambition, regardless of what motivational books tell you. It's also about being kinder. Everything just fucks up. I always get this, always. I know how you feel. What is it that you do? Delivering party supplies. Oh, yeah. Engaging selflessly with others makes us happier just by the sheer fact of bringing them joy. How long have you been doing this for then? I started the job about three weeks ago and all of that is shit. Everything's my fault. The boss is an arsehole. What can you do? Nothing. Is, is this what you want to do in life? Well, I want to be a chef. I should be a chef. Why aren't you being a chef? Oh, this is your life, mate. This is, you know, this is what this is what it's about. It, it's your one chance. When you want something bad enough, you'll find yourself making decisions, you know, the the that you never thought that you would do. I found myself doing that recently, you know, taking a look at myself, taking a look at my life. Mine and your situation's not too different, to be honest, mate. You know, worrying about what your boss is going to say, worrying about where, what, what your next move is, but I think somewhere inside you, you know where your next move is. Fuck it, do you know what I mean? You've said it, you've said it all, you've said it all. Do you know what? Loads of shit in the van, keys in the ignition, it won't work, but keep it, have it. What do you mean? I'm done with it, mate. What about your boss? Sorry, my boss is a wanker. <laughs> Take it, have it, I'm done, mate, I'm done with it. Right then. Mate, you're a geezer, honestly. I'm done. So, yeah. This sounds like a very different Matt from the listless young man I met at the game show interview. Thank you, Mr. Pardon, Matt. Matt is developing the ability to inspire others, but what will he do with a van full of party gear? Fancy arranging a party? Where? In the street. With what? I've just fallen upon some nice stuff. Might as well not let it go to waste. Matthew, you're right. Yeah. We're having a party. Let's do what? When are we having a party? Right now. Right what, now. It's sunny, it's sunny, Chris. And where are we having a party? What, it's sunny. Right here. Right here. <laughs> His family have been told to play along with anything Matt suggests, but his neighbours are unprepared for the knock at the door. Hiya. I was wondering whether or not you would fancy coming to a party in the street, and I will provide everything. Old Matt would have never even asked his neighbours for a cup of sugar. I've got, I've got all the stuff. Food, everything. If you want to invite the family, then you can. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Matt doesn't usually see much of his dad and big brother, but has even called them up to come along. Every single one of you is invited if you've got nothing else to do. A friend of a friend might be able to supply really? a band. We've got bands. <laughs> the whole street has come alive, and it's all down to Matt recklessly seizing a mad opportunity. <laughs> determination now and a lot more self-confidence. <laughs> he would never have done that before. 
Not in a million years. It's not just with his neighbours that Matt's connecting. For years, he's been distant from his mum, but that's all starting to change. <laughs> I wouldn't normally see the family hugging and dancing, but not normally in that situation. <laughs> I've got my arm round him and he got his arm round me and I just felt a lot more comfortable with him and that, that it was just such a natural thing to, for us to do. <laughs> Matt will need to draw on this new bold selflessness in 13 days, 23 hours and 59 minutes if he's going to step up and take the controls of an aircraft filled with panicked passengers. In final preparation for Matt's complete transformation from ordinary to extraordinary, I need him to break free from the fears that stop him becoming the man he could be. And to ensure that I feel Matt is ready for this challenge, we're going to meet with him in a normal waking state for the first time since the auditions for the game show. Hello. How are you? How's, um, how's life? Yeah, life's, uh, life's really good, yeah. Everything's going really well. The biggest obstacle we all face in life is fear. Courage is not the absence of fear, it's the mastery of it. Have you ever tried a straight jacket on? Um, no, I no. Never. I'll put your hands through there. <laughs> Houdini was iconic because his escapes represented overcoming fear at the time of the Great Depression. It was a powerful metaphor. I used to play this game. I used to live, there were these train tracks, and you very rarely get any trains coming at that time, so it was so late. And I used to go and lay on the tracks. It was just such a liberating thing to do, just laying there, knowing that you shouldn't be there, knowing that it was dangerous. I need Matt to feel that he can master his own fear. Yeah, I want you to experience this, because it's such a, you're, you're absolutely safe on this for the moment, so. But uh, come and come and stand here, yeah, if you. Okay, I've got you. There you go. Mind your head on that. So what's that like? Feels really weird. Yeah? It goes against all your senses, really. Just slid, slid. Well, I'm somewhere where, where, where I really shouldn't be. Well, uh, I hate to interrupt you, but we will have the 543 heading down any minute, so you probably... Any minute? Yeah, you'll probably hear it coming before anyone sees it, so you, you probably want to think about getting out. Have you ever done this before? <laughs> Never. I've never laid on a truck before. No, I suppose not. Well, I've got the instructions. Uh, I mean, these are Davenport's instructions. They're a bit tricky to read through. So before you do anything, examine your straight jacket thoroughly. Make sure it's put on properly. Put on with the opening to the rear. Have the back straps. You got the these. Yeah. So you want to reach back behind your back. Uh, with either arm, and there should be a, uh, a buckle on the back. There are four buckles on the back. You want to try and reach one of them on the back and undo it. It's a bit tricky because it'll be back to front, but... You got it? No, I can't leave the train. And there's a train coming. This will help train it. Uh, what's been done? Let me... Square your shoulders. Did, did you square your shoulders when we put it on? I don't remember. <laughs> You probably want to hurry up. Can you not just? Can you not get it? I can't reach it. Oh no! Can you try the other side. Go around the other way. I want to keep my arm there. Did you ever see the film? Uh, what's it called? Strangers on the Train. Have you seen it? Oh, you haven't seen it. Classic Hitchcock's fantastic. It's one of his five best. It's a proper tale of suspense. Can you, you go, just grab the? I can't. Can I can't reach it. Yes, you can. Yes, you can. I honestly can't reach it. All right, well, try, try, can you sort of grab, grab the one underneath? Oh. Can you grab the one underneath? Okay. No, there's no way I can leave. Yeah, you probably want to... There's 
know what happened next time or what. Okay, left arm, try that. Sit up, pull it out, over your head, pull it arm out. That's it, up over your head. That's it, keep going, keep going. Right, grab the strut, grab the strut, go on. You do your shoulder, you just like, oh. What's that like? My heart is pounding, honestly, that's proper. But look, look, you faced a fear there. You did something terrifying and you controlled it and you dealt with it and you escaped from that. Well done. Let's get this off you. There would have been a time where I'd have just crumbled and just accepted my fate. Whereas more and more, as every day goes past, I realise that your fate is what you make it. change in Matt is probably determination and I think he has realised that he can he can do anything that he wants he can achieve anything it seems to be very upbeat about everything much more approachable and and much more relaxed and yeah there's a, a definite change I'm hoping that these changes stay I think the change in Matt is just what he needed really it really is just what he needed After years of living with his mum, Matt is finally moving out. He and Liv have bought their own place together. He's been to see a careers advisor and has finally made inroads into the police force. His relationships with Liv and the family have never been stronger. But to change his world once and for all, Matt must first make what may be the most important decision of his life. To be or not to be, a hero. Our lives are defined not by our pasts, but by our choices. And choices are things that happen right now, this moment, right now in the present. Matt's choices have transformed not only himself, but also the relationships around him. And now he has one final choice to make in a packed plane at 30,000 feet. But he also has his biggest obstacle yet to overcome. Matt is absolutely terrified of flying. To get him on a plane and give him the opportunity to become a hero, we've told Matt that the game show, which he still believes is due to take part in, is being filmed in Jersey. For him to participate, we have no option but to fly him down. As his countdown clock ticks towards the zero hour, we secretly film a nervous Matt as he checks in at the airport. To make this whole experience completely authentic for Matt, we've chartered our own aircraft, which will genuinely take off on a one and a half hour journey. We've rigged the plane with hidden cameras and microphones. All of the passengers are actors whose seating positions have been carefully planned. Some are carrying hidden cameras. All cabin crew are genuine. Everybody on board except for Matt has been fully rehearsed and knows what's going to happen. I'm on board in disguise, seated at the front where Matt can't see me. He has no idea of the events about to unfold. Do you know where you sit here? 7D. 7D. It's just the center of the No, I'm all right, yeah. <laughs> Why should I excuse you? It's just if I start acting quite weird. Why are you scared of flying? It's not like that. Yeah. I think when I'm up there, I'll be all right, but if you can just support, like, help me with it. Really? 
A very good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Jamie. I'd like to welcome you on board this flight shortly departing to Jersey. Thank you, doors to automatic cross check and report when ready, please. It's now time to take you through the safety features and equipment that we carry on board. The emergency exits are located on both sides of the aircraft. Please take a moment now to locate your nearest exit. Matt is so nervous, I've asked the actors around him to support him where possible. We'll be flying at 30,000 feet when Matt will be faced with the choice of whether to seize the opportunity to be a hero or remain a bystander. First 40 minutes run to plan as we climb to 30,000 feet. It's time now to start the final sequence of events and discover whether Matt can become a hero. What will unfold is a scenario which, due to aviation authority regulations, could never happen on this or any other airline. Ladies and gentlemen, I've just spoken with the captain and he has found it necessary to switch on the seatbelt sign. There's been possibility of turbulence up ahead. If you ask all passengers, please to return to their seats and ensure that you have securely fastened your seatbelts and removed personal headphones. Attention, please. The captain has informed me that due to unforeseen circumstances, we do need to divert the aircraft and we'll be landing at our nearest airport as soon as possible. Again, we will get you there, sir, I promise. Again, the captain holds the seat. Seriously, go up there, find out, come back. I doesn't tell me anything. I don't know anything. <laughs> Attention, please. Due to a medical emergency, I'm sorry to report that the captain is currently incapacitated and will not be unable to land the aircraft safely. The captain are fully prepared to deal with emergency situations and will surely be demonstrating to you the safety procedures applicable to this aircraft. Please remain calm and listen to our instructions really carefully. Matt's 30-day countdown is coming to an end. He will have 60 seconds to make his choice. 
We are, however, in a position now where it has become necessary to ask if there is a passenger on board who will be willing to help land this plane. If you are prepared to help, please make yourselves known to the crew. If Matt doesn't volunteer, he will never be the hero. He now has less than a minute to change his world once and for all. Titan state allows me to quickly put him into a hypnotic sleep. That's the events you've witnessed were safe, controlled and ultimately unrealistic. They were agreed in advance with the airline and relevant authorities. The last thing Matt was aware of was walking towards the door of the cockpit. When I wake him up, he will believe he's entering the same cockpit, faced with the challenge of landing the plane and saving the lives of over a hundred passengers. plane lands safely. Matt, still in a hypnotic state, is unaware of any time passing and is transferred to a completely convincing pilot's training simulator. All of the actors who have been part of Matt's journey change and get ready to watch him take the controls. This state-of-the-art simulator cost over £7 million and provides a terrifyingly realistic experience. When I wake him, Matt will absolutely feel he is still on board the real plane and walking into the cockpit. Our pilot takes his position, and as I wake Matt, the steward guides him to his seat. Here. Oh my god. You'll be fine. No, it's all right. It's all right, it's all right. Is he all right? We hope so, we just need to get down. We should put these on. Okay. Who's going to be talking to me? The air traffic controller is going to help us. Can you hear them? Is that speaking to me now? Um, my name's Matt. Oh, hello, Matt. I'm going to talk you through it step by step, one button at a time. The captain's done a brilliant job so far. He's obviously not very well. He's already declared a major emergency. You're under a mayday call right now, which means you're my primary concern. The aircraft have been cleared out of the way, and you've got a direct route now towards London Gatwick. Is that understood? Yeah, how do you want me to do it though? Because I'm going to talk you through it. Yep, I'm going to talk you through it step by step. What I need you to do now is just look at a few of the instruments that are around. Okay. So are you okay. holding the control button? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, keep it. 2500. With your right thumb, press that button. With Autopilot. Yep. Disengage. Press that button. Is it meant to do that? It's meant to do that. So just below the window, you'll see an animal with lots of numbers. Can you see one that says 30,000? It should be in about the middle. Yeah, I can okay. see it, yeah. Okay, can you set 3,000? That's telling me I want you to set. Whoa, it's making a noise. That's fine. That's just the aeroplane telling you you've set a different altitude. If you could keep turning that knob until it says 3,000, what would please, man? <laughs> so 3,000. 3,000, there it's there. Brilliant. <laughs> Doing great. Um, thanks. Can you believe I got on a plane for the first time today in 10 years and look what happened? You were born to fly. 2500. But just to the right hand side, you'll see what looks like a wheel. You need to pull it towards you and put it down and that's going to put the wheels down. Is that to the end? Yes. Looking really good. What am I doing? This is where you're going to have to land the aeroplane. Okay. I'm ready. You're ready. Brilliant. That's what I want to hear. See the display ahead of you? 
Yeah. I want you to keep those wings nice and level. Yeah. Just near your right hand, there's a thrust lever. There's two levers in the middle. Yeah. At the side of there, there's another button. I need you to press that twice. What does it say? It just says auto throttle. There. Uh, right. Okay. Now I want you to look out the window. Can you see the runway? Yeah. We've got you on radar. You're doing a brilliant job, Matt. I want you to look out the window and you're going to land this aeroplane for me, okay? I'm looking. You're doing brilliantly. Thanks, man. Can you see the runway ahead of you now? Yeah, yeah. What you're do you want me to do? I want you to land the aeroplane. When you get close to the ground, you're going to have to just pull back a little bit more on the stick than you have been. Pull it really. towards me. Just a little bit. When it says 30, I want you to pull back just a little bit. Light slow. Line. Line slow. No. Line slow. Ten. Yeah, keep it nice and straight there, Matt. That's a really good job, mate. Just what you need to do. You'll start to slow down now. That's brilliant. You did a brilliant job, mate. Thanks. I could have done it without you. You've done a brilliant job, mate. You've done it all on your own. Well done. You did it, Matt. I should have known. Listen to me. That choice that you made to volunteer and help land the plane was the choice to be a hero. You are a hero, Matt. The millions of people that have followed your transformational journey, you have inspired many of them, Matt. The people watching you are so proud of you. I am so very, very proud of you, Matt. This is the proudest moment in my career, standing here, meeting you, and talking to you after what you've just done, after everything that you've achieved. How are you feeling? Overwhelmed, isn't it? Um, when I was on the airplane and like, they needed somebody. Nobody stood up, you know, and that. I didn't want to be one of those people that didn't stand up, you know? You were expecting a game show. This has all been a game show. And you've been the only contestant. And you've won. OK? My friend. <laughs> I'll explain it all to you. Oh, I'm so proud of you. Come with me. house you broke into, his real name's Joe. Can I have this guy here? He shot the gun in your face in a petrol station. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't get tired to look at you, face. More guys from the aeroplane. You may remember Liam. <laughs> That was Matt's journey. What choices would you have made? Well, the date is 8, 9, 10, and the time is just coming up to 11, 12. This is a unique moment, and time to start someone else's journey right now.